Welcome to the Genealogy Professional Podcast, the resource for transitional and experienced genealogists who want to create a successful business. I'm your host, Miriam Pierre-Louis. Here you'll learn from professionals all around the world who work in the field of genealogy. Are you ready to learn and grow together? Then let's get started. This podcast is sponsored in part by the Association of Professional Genealogists. You can find out more about them at www.apgen.org. Welcome to Episode 8 of the Genealogy Professional Podcast. Today we travel to Georgia to get to know genealogist Linda Woodward Geiger. Linda, welcome to the Genealogy Professional Podcast. Such a pleasure to be here, Marian. Thank oh, you I'm, so much for inviting me. I'm so excited to have you here. It's wonderful to be able to pick apart your brain with all the experience that you have. So let's get started by having you tell us about yourself and give us an overview of your genealogy business. Well, at the current time, I'm slowing down a little bit because of the adage, you know, the cobbler's children have no shoes, and my family has genealogy that's not going to get done if I don't do it. So I am slowing down a bit. However, I really enjoy doing a lot of different things to help people. I do a lot of guided uh, training now. So I guide people how to do their own genealogy more than doing it for them. So I think that, you know, some at some point, if you don't know how to go about it, then you aren't going to understand whether you have a good professional helping you or not or what to expect from them. I also do a um, lot of web development for genealogists and for genealogical societies. I do a lot of lecturing and training. I think that's my very favorite part. And uh, do a bit of photography on occasion and community studies. When you say that you do guided genealogy, do you mean that you're creating research plans that uh, clients can follow? I am assisting clients to do their research plans. So I, I know their problem solving, what they want to solve, what their goals are. I have research plan in my head, but I don't want to just give it to them. I want them to discover that they can make their own and how to do the planning, how to work around certain problems, and how to analyze what they find. Okay, great. So that's really kind of like one-on-one tutoring and education. Yes, it is. Oh, that's neat. I've never heard of anybody doing that before. That is so neat. Great. What inspired you to become a genealogy professional? I think moving. I moved to Georgia with when my husband was transferred here. My late husband was transferred here in 1985, and I left all my resources. I left because all of my family, uh, three quarters, were in Boston or the North Shore by 1650. And I was suddenly being removed from all of that. I w- had been brought up in New Hampshire, and I, uh, we were living in Massachusetts at the time. So when I moved to Georgia, I thought, oh, my gosh, I've got to really learn how to do this from afar. So I started um, that way. And I didn't be- think about becoming a professional genealogist until after I had acquired my certification as a certified record specialist. Then I said, oh, well, why don't I help others do this? But I I didn't go into certification thinking that I wanted to be a professional. What was your thought process behind getting certified if if you didn't consider becoming a professional at that point? I wanted to know that I was doing the best for my family that I could possibly do. I just wanted to know that I met standards and that I knew what I was doing. I just wanted that validation. Most people come to genealogy from another profession. What were you doing before you decided to become a genealogy professional, if anything? I was taught high school mathematics, which really relates a lot to genealogy because I I knew how to solve problems and I had analytical skills that I needed. So they really worked hand in hand. What did you do to pre, uh, prepare yourself to become a genealogy professional, both from an educational point of view and from the business point of view? Now, you talked about uh, getting certified, which is one great step, but there's maybe there's other things that you did 
to prepare yourself for? Well, to prepare myself for certification, well, of course, at first, when I started doing my own family research way back before I left Massachusetts, so probably at least five or six years before we had to move, I soon learned that there were other people out there who did the same thing. And when we moved to Georgia, my husband found an ad in one of the Atlanta papers of a gal who was teaching genealogy classes. And I said, oh my, and he said, you probably would be interested in this. And I said, you bet. So I had my first encounter with uh, Diane Dealey, who has now passed away, but she and her husband uh, lived in the Dunwoody area. And then later after uh, he retired, they moved out to Salt Lake. But she was the my guiding light at the beginning. And I learned, oh my gosh, I need to cite my sources. And oh my gosh, all of this stuff I had done, I never even knew there were printed genealogy forms when I started, you know, that I could buy a pedigree chart. I had always made my own. And then I had, I was early on a computer user. So I learned how to do that using a spreadsheet. I thought, how easy this is, I can just buy it. So the first thing I did was take that class, and then I took the uh, NGS home study course, and I learned that there were conferences out there, and the first national conference I attended was the one in Jacksonville, Florida in 1991. That's after I had stopped teaching full-time and was able to go, and, and it didn't interfere with my working schedule. So started doing conferences. So that's how I got got into it. That conference in in Jacksonville, did you say what, who sponsored that conference? Oh, that was, no, I didn't. That was NGS. Oh, okay. That one. And you were probably able to drive to that, huh? Yes. That's nice. Yes. (laughs) That's what I, I dream about that actually being able to drive to a national conference because they don't ever seem to come to the Northeast or I know that. Well, we had FGS in Boston a few years back. Yeah, it was. 2005 maybe. Yeah, it's getting to be almost 10 years back. (laughs) Whoa, I guess you're right. That's not such a few, is it? Now, you had mentioned that being a math teacher was very helpful to you. Um, when you went into genealogy, what skills specifically did you bring to your genealogy business? How did math help you? And what other skills might you have had that helped you as well? Well, certainly the analytical skills. When you do problem solving in math, especially when the higher mathematics like uh, advanced trig and geometry, things like that, you really have to analyze the situation and you have to think things through. Maybe a bit of scientific background as well. At one time, I did teach physics, and you have problem solving there a lot when you have, particularly when you have labs and things like that. So that really enabled me to work around different problems and and to start making research plans. How am I going to do this to save time when you're out in the field? Uh, It reminds me of the first time I went to Salt Lake City, went... um, with a couple of other ladies. And I remember one gal, Susan Cook, who told me and she helped me plan ahead so that I didn't waste time when I got to Salt Lake. And we had another gal go with us who just didn't have time to prepare. And she went home after the first day because she was so overwhelmed. She didn't know where to begin. So I think that problem solving, helping you look at the whole puzzle and and think of steps what do you need to do? Plan ahead it was so important. And it doesn't matter if you're going to Salt Lake City or if you're going to your local library or the local university library. It doesn't make any difference. You need to be prepared. So I think those what really helped me most. Of course, I hated history when I was a kid uh, in high school and in college both because at that time, I'm dating myself, but that's okay. I'm proud of my gray hair. We had professors and teachers who only talked about the important events and the important people and dates. It was dates, places. It was not anything else. And I think when I started doing genealogy, I suddenly realized, you know, if it weren't for my family and the uh, the, the peons, if you will, and families of most of us, those big guys would have been nothing. They would never have succeeded. 
they wouldn't have been able to win the wars and to take all the glory away. So I realized that my people were really involved in all of that and that history really affected every single one of them. I want to ask you what skills you lacked when you started your genealogy business and how you overcame them. But I also am curious to know what skills you thought you needed or, or for your business, because I think genealogy has changed quite a bit since the 90s. So perhaps you can give her a, a broader view over your career, because maybe in the 90s, you didn't feel like you needed a website or you didn't need to do marketing or something like that for your business. Right. So in the 90s, of course, there were no websites per se. I remember being on a genealogy forum with Pro, um, Prodigy or something like that. But I had started learning computers when I was teaching mathematics, and I had used a lot of those skills to help me work around things that weren't available on the Internet. But no, we didn't have to have uh, websites because they didn't exist for, for individuals back then. But the thing I really lacked was the ability to read old handwriting and the really kind of uh, history as well. So I had to read, 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 read about, well, I was then in Georgia, so the Civil War came to mind. And, and this is where the Civil War was fought, where when I lived in Massachusetts, I was more interested in the revolution because that was on the territory there, but also the uh, five civilized tribes down here. So it was just reading, lots and lots of reading before the internet gave us great things. Now, today we are so lucky to have YouTube and all of the gen web things to help us as long as we don't take everything as the gospel truth and learn how to analyze what we're seeing or reading. But really, reading documents was so hard for me at first. And when I would go into a courthouse to look for a record, I would make sure I took Helen Leary was my, I wanted to be just like Helen when I grew up. She was one of my instructors at IGHR the first time I went, and that was before I was certified. When I went, that's the Institute of Historical and Genealogical Research in Birmingham at Samford University. And the first course I took there was Elizabeth Schoen Mills course four. I, I skipped everything else because I had done enough background work and she allowed me to do that. I'm sorry I skipped the other things, but uh, nonetheless, Helen Leary just taught me so much and I wanted to be just like her when I grew up. So she had told us to learn when we were learning how to read the handwriting, things like that, to make sure that we read at least 10 pages before. It's not That doesn't just apply to census records, reading the 10 families before and the 10 families after. It applies to the court records as well, so that you can become familiar with the clerk's handwriting. So she, that was very instrumental in helping me overcome that deficit that I had in, in reading that. What was the hardest part of starting a genealogy business for you? Trying to let people know that I was in the business and because we didn't have websites, we didn't have social media, we didn't have any of that. But the biggest way to do it back then, at least that I thought was, was to make an ad in Evidence Helper, which I'm not sure ever did very good, but they got some of my money anyway. But it was word of mouth, and it wasn't long before I started doing some training myself, and I would go to different places and offer my service, especially the first time I was giving a lecture. I needed to practice on somebody. So I would offer my service pro bono to groups that would allow me to do that when I was developing lectures. And then I became, I got myself known up in the genealogy world that way. And when I was speaking at, first started speaking at conferences. So that really helped a lot. But it was hard getting starting the business and, and letting people know you were available and that you were skilled. Very difficult. I can imagine at that point, especially pre-internet, that it would have been really difficult. But Everton's Helper, Genealogical Helper, was a, a great magazine. My, my mom used to get that. And that was the way everybody communicated. You remember they had pages and pages of queries at the back. The root seller. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, that yes. that's how it got done. Yeah. Yeah. Can you that share? That was the good old days. 
Can you share a, a story of an obstacle that you encountered early in your career and how you, or at some point in your career, it doesn't have to be early, um, and how you worked around it? Sherman, you know, came through with uh, the Union troops. And he, although things did happen, nasty things did happen, every courthouse in Georgia was not burned because of Sherman. And I, I laugh at one courthouse where they had a fire in 1890, and they told me Sherman burned their courthouse. And I had to really be good about not laughing in their faces because I needed their service and I needed to be professional. But I said, you know, Sherman didn't burn everything. But we've had a lot of fires here in Georgia, just like they have in other places. So my hardest uh, obstacles are burn courthouses and learning how to circumvent those. And we don't want to forget that there are often state copies of records that were created, uh, tax records perhaps that were taught in the towns or the, the counties here in, in Georgia. We also have a lot of state land records that we can use. We have newspapers we can use. It's learning how to get around those burned counties. And there are ways. There are ways. It's not always easy, but that, that was the hardest thing to learn, how to circumvent the burned counties. How have the services that you've offered changed over the years? Because you offer some really diverse and unique services now, and I'm sure that when you first started, you probably didn't offer those. How, how has it changed <laughs> for you? Well, certainly... Um, so I uh, look at uh, the things that I have listed on my website, the desktop publishing. I love to help people get their word out there. And I do help and set it up so that they have a coffee table book, if that's what they want, or something that's useful. So it has an index and is logically arranged. So desktop publishing, I was never, well, I was an okay typist. Uh, I didn't like it, however. And when computers were finally the thing to do, and of course I had been using them since 1972 when they first came out, and that was back with digital services in Westboro, Mass. When I was teaching there, we had a lot of options with, as the computers developed. So I love to help people design, and I use. I started out using PageMaker and then went into what InDesign now is the top of the line for that. And certainly I wasn't developing uh, websites for professional genealogists or societies when I started out because that just wasn't an option. So those things, both of those things developed because of my continuing to acquire computer skills as I continued to have my interest. I think I'm probably the only one here in my community who has this, I am uh, by myself now and I have five computers. No, I mean, really, does wow. that tell you something about me? That's amazing. <laughs> so I'm sensing that the web design and InDesign and all that kind of stuff stems from your personal interest in pursuing those things. Yes, yes, because they, um, I found it so when, you know, you go to Salt Lake City, you go to a library and you see published genealogies, whether they were type doesn't matter if they were on typewriters or what, but if they weren't prepared well, they were so difficult to use. And they're always a part of whenever I do a new work on a new subject, I use those things as a one of the preliminaries just to see if somebody has done something great, why would I want to in, reinvent the wheel? But most of the time they were just so blur and so bad and no index. But I thought, well, with my computer skills, then I certainly can offer that service uh, to others. And I've helped a lot of people. I have a friend, John Carver, who's done an awful lot of books on Cherokee County, Georgia, and Pickens County, Georgia. And I helped uh, him get his marriage books and cemetery books and newspaper books, get them into a good form and, and indexed. And I have another good friend, Ted Brooke, who I've helped a lot in that way as well. So really rewarding to have good books out there because I was able to help them. And you mentioned earlier that you do public speaking and teaching and workshops, things like that. Do you also do 
writing, um, like articles for magazines, things like that. And at what point did you decide that you would branch out into speaking and or writing? Well, the speaking was a natural thing for me to do since I taught all those years. I mean, teaching genealogy because I taught all those years. So teaching was just something that was inbred in me, I guess. My grandmother was a teacher and my mother was a teacher. And I just loved helping people uh, learn new things. So that that was kind of a no-brainer. That was one of the first things that I started doing after I felt I had enough knowledge to assist others. And I uh, became a certified lecturer, genealogical lecturer. Uh, I was number 17, 17th person that became a certified genealogical lecturer. So there weren't very many early on. And I think I I acquired that credential in 1998. So that was kind of a no-brainer. I mean, that was me. That I'm, I'm a teacher. Then the writing was more difficult because in mathematics, when you teach mathematics, I can solve a mean equation. But writing was really difficult for me, even though I did have some good background in grammar and that kind of thing. But it was hard. And so I forced myself to do a, a, some writing. And I did write for several magazines for a long while. And now I am not very good right at this moment for the last Four months or so I've been horrible at keeping up with my blogs, but that's a way for me to learn how to write and do it in little pieces and not have to do a great big thing. I mean, I can publish a book and do a book, but that's indexing. That's not really writing. It's not, you know, as as you think of somebody really doing any writing, that's just compiling. That's easy. I find writing difficult, but I force myself to do it. I want to talk about your web design services just a little bit more. This is a service that's very different from doing genealogical research or other services that might be more specifically related to genealogy. How do you manage web design as a service in your business alongside of genealogical research? Is it is it forcing your brain to think differently, or do you find that it, it blends kind of nicely. And also, from a management point of view, do you have to structure your web design services differently than how you do your genealogical research? I don't really have to structure the business differently at all because you still have to structure your time. Actually, web design is a little bit easier than providing genealogical research per se or consulting because I don't have to go anywhere. I can do it at 4 o'clock in the morning. I'm an early riser, and I can do that early. I don't have to wait for a library or archives to open or, or travel there. So, that, But I also think that I limit that to historical and genealogical societies and professionals in those fields because I have some type of – I can offer them my skills in knowing the – knowing that world, knowing what societies need, know what individuals need, and some of the, and I can offer suggestions. And I know that that will make their service, especially professional genealogists, it's, if you have a good website, that's really very helpful. Unfortunately, I don't keep mine up as well as I should because I'm too busy working on others. There's the cobbler again, the cobbler's children, no shoes. What has been the most challenging aspect of being a genealogy professional from a business point of view? Uh, not giving away my time. Well, I still give away my time. I have When I do client work, and I'm doing less of that, as I mentioned earlier, uh, specifically to do the actual research itself, I find it very difficult to pull in the reins and not give away a lot of time. I still find that so difficult. Writing reports, because I'm not a good at it. I'm I'm not a writer per se. Writing reports, especially when they're going to be negative, is so very difficult for me. I spend way too much time, way too much time. But when I am hired to do research, then I do my services, as most genealogists do, on a time basis. And I'm authorized a certain amount of time. I don't have any trouble sticking to the task that I have to do 
but I find it difficult to stick to that timeline. And then, so therefore I'm eating the time. I can't charge a client money just because it's taken me longer to write a report than I expected. to. And it always does. It always takes longer than I, I said, oh, I should be getting good at this. I've been doing it for 20 years. Still find it so difficult. That's the most challenging thing to me. When you have been going to conferences and, and different professional development opportunities throughout the years, have you ever come across somebody who has presented on this exact topic about how do you discipline yourself not to go beyond this either the specific scope or the specific time frame? Because this seems to be the number one problem that genealogists have. And, and part of that is enthusiasm. They just get so excited about what they're researching, they can't stop. Yeah, I've ha- heard a couple, especially um, at the APG professional management conferences. I've heard people talk about the subject, but it's never. I've never heard anything that really worked for me. And I'm not really sure that anyone who gave those talks, it really worked for them either. You know, it was good rhetoric, good ideas, but you, you've just got to put blinders on, I guess, and and pull in the reins. So what I'm hearing is there's no cure. <laughs> not that I have found. And if, you, if I hear of one, I'm going to share it with the world. <laughs> well, let me know and I'll help you share it. <laughs> okay. How do you balance paid work versus volunteering? Oh, that is difficult. You have to set a, when you have a paid work client, I feel that you have That is the priority. That is number one. But sometimes when you are volunteering, especially volunteering to help societies with their programs or their websites or their webinars, there are certain things that you have to do on time in a timely fashion. So whether it's volunteering or getting paid, there's sometimes you've got to make a priority list and and what comes first. So in order to manage that, I have to really give myself a good schedule and stick to it and make sure that I do a client's work first. I don't, I hate to be kept waiting a long time and I know they do as well and it's not fair to them. So I just make myself stick to my schedule, have a to-do list every day. When you take on a client project, and let's say it's a slightly larger client project, do you give uh, your client a specific due date of when they can expect the end product? Because I think that's another issue for genealogists, that sometimes they delay things a bit. And, well, and- I don't accept a new client or I tell them that I cannot start until a particular time so that I will get the work done in a timely fashion. It's very rare that I don't get it done in a timely fashion, but that's because I don't say, oh, yes, I'll start on that soon. If it's going to take me three months to get there because I know what I have ahead of me, then I tell them I can't do it until that time. And if they still want me, then let's make an agreement now so I can schedule on that time slot and save it for you. So do you actually put a a date in your contract that says you will have this by this specific date? I don't have it. No, I don't. No, I don't. Because you don't know if somebody's going to get sick or if somebody in your family is going to be sick or if there's going to be weather. Weather, imagine that. Mm -hmm. I mean, even here in Georgia, we've had a little bit of trouble with, we are so lucky that we don't have things in the minus zero, but we've got things down in the single digits. And um, cars don't work as well down here. But no, you can't, I couldn't possibly tell somebody I would have something done by a certain amount of time. Okay. I, I couldn't do it. I couldn't justify that. Linda, what is the most fun project that you've ever worked on that you can share with us? Well, probably the most fun. I can't. But uh, the next of the most fun I've ever had is working on the Federal Road Project here in the North Georgia mountains. This is a road that was developed in 1804 with an agreement between the Cherokee and the federal government. It's called the Federal Road. The federal government never paid for the road, but I have had a lot of fun learning where the road went, what its course was, how it was used, and the people and the families and the Indians that lived near the road and the consequences of the road. It was a the minute 
you had a good path in the federal government, of course, did use it for mail services in the 1800s, early 1800s, even before removal. But once you have a road in or a good path, it's a good way for intruders to come in and how did they affect the Indians. So that was a lot of fun because here I am, I live on the land where the Cherokee were living. Not me and many other people, I don't know. But yeah, so I think that was been the most fun. And it's been great in sharing some of that work and ideas with people, acquaintances and friends that I've made within the Cherokee Nation and being able to share that at different symposiums and things. Was that project done for a private client or was it done for the government or...? It was done uh, mostly for uh, Trail of Tears Association. Oh, okay. Let's take a quick break to hear a message from the Association of Professional Genealogists. Hello. This is Kimberly Powell, President-Elect of the Association of Professional Genealogists. APG is an international membership organization dedicated to supporting all individuals in the business of genealogy, whether you're an archivist, librarian, educator, writer, or researcher. Our 2,600 members include genealogists at all stages of their professional careers, from those just starting out to some of the field's most renowned leaders. Learn how to grow your business and network with other professionals through our educational webinars, informal mentoring groups, active discussion lists, the APG Quarterly, and our annual professional management conference. Visit us online at apgen.org to learn how we can help you on your professional journey and how you can help us advance public awareness and understanding of the profession of genealogy. Okay, Linda, we are about to enter the lightning round. And this oh is yeah, this is where I am going to bombard you with a whole bunch of questions, and you are going to come back with brilliant answers that are going to help all the genealogists out there who are listening. Are you ready? The brilliant part? Yes, I've got my... <laughs> I've got my light bulb on. Oh, good. Yes. Oh, good. What was the one thing you were most afraid of in starting your business? Most afraid that I wouldn't be good enough. And I don't think we ever can be so sure of ourselves. I have to, We worry about that. A good genealogist or a good professional of any kind worries about that every day. What is the best advice you've ever received? I think Helen Leary is telling us to uh, read, 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 and to not just look at one document, look at a whole series of them. That was the best advice I ever got. What is one specific action listeners can take in the next 24 hours to help them transition into a genealogy career? To make sure that you join a local genealogical society, and it doesn't matter whether you have ancestors there or not, I have zero Southern ancestry. And if I hadn't become involved in the Georgia Genealogical Society early on, I would have missed all kinds of opportunities. When those those societies, local societies, have a lot of great help in different developing different skills and different record groups, I can apply what I learned here in Georgia well, maybe the New England doesn't have Georgia land lotteries, obviously, but they do have land, and I can apply a lot of the things I learned. So I think whether or not you have anybody in your area of residence, any ancestors or anything, you join that society. There you go. Do you have a productivity tool like a Dropbox or Evernote that you love and that you can share with the audience? I love both Dropbox and Evernote, actually. Uh, Dropbox, I do. Now it saves so much time. I don't have to mail things to clients. I've had reports get lost, and then you have to duplicate them, get new copies. Uh, Dropbox is great. I I love it for for mostly give digital reports now and and give them digital images. I love Evernote. That is my go-to thing on the road. If I am in the field, because I can take my iPad, which is very nice, and I can use Evernote, and then I can access that information from any computer anywhere. So I just love those, both. Do you have any other apps that you love that help you get through the day? I think those those two would just okay. about do it. What is your preferred social media channel, both for communicating with colleagues and with clients? 
Maybe you don't do social media with clients, but how? what's your preferred channel for communicating with yeah, clients? Yeah, I don't do social media with clients, but I, my preferred is Facebook, and I guess that's because I started there, started with that one first. I think Google Plus has an awful lot to offer, but I don't have enough time in my day to look at all the blogs I want to read and then follow communications on Google Plus as well as Facebook. So I generally... St- stick to Facebook. If you could recommend one book for our listeners, what would it be? Well, I have so many people. It doesn't matter what part of the country that they live. They all, if you've got an Indian ancestor, it's got to be Cherokee. I uh, say that tongue in cheek. But I know a lot of people know that Cherokees weren't in Wisconsin. However, some people don't. I think if you think you have uh, Cherokee ancestry or Creek ancestry, the best books on the shelf that you should go and get, or if you're going to be a professional and you're going to you become an expert in the five civilized tribes, you need tracing ancestors among the five civilized tribes, Southeastern Indians prior to removal by Rochelle Mills Lennon. Uh, that's available uh, through Genealogy Publishing Company. And I also recommend that any, no matter which record group that you like for federal records, that you make sure you get a copy of the preliminary inventories. Um, A lot of those are out of print now, but you can find them because people, I know that Craig Scott in his heritage books, he reproduces a lot of them. But I have also done a lot of scanning of the ones that I have because we don't need any more paper in our libraries anyway. But the if you're doing Indian research, for example, you really need to have a copy of records of the Bureau of Indian Affairs. There are two volumes. And the preliminary inventories of what's available at the National Archives, not just in Washington or College Park, but also uh, what's available in other places as well. So Make sure you're familiar with preliminary inventories for federal records. Okay, and I will put the links to those in the show notes on Linda's page so that people can just go there and find the information and click to it. I will somehow um, find some examples of these preliminary inventories, whether um, at Craig Scott's website or, or wherever. So we'll be able to show you exactly what she's talking about. The next question is typically a hypothetical scenario, and I'm going to change this up a little (laughs) completely for you, okay, Mm -hmm. because you've got the web design business. So let's say hypothetically, hypothetically, you moved back to New England, and let's say you got tired of doing web design, and you wanted to do another service that was not specifically genealogical research, but you wanted to do a service for the genealogical community. So let's say you wanted to become a podcaster or an internet broadcaster, okay? Okay. What are you going to do in the first month of this business to introduce this new service to people and explain to them why they might need this service? The first thing I would do probably is to use social media. In that case, I might even go over to Google Plus and, and make use of that as well. But I would use social media because that's the best way, I think, in this day and age to get the word out. And you can have on Facebook, you can have your personal account, but you also can have business accounts. And you can do an awful lot of advertising that way. So I I would go to social media. What would you do for the part of convincing people? Because even now, not all genealogists are convinced they need a website. So when you encounter an even newer technology, sometimes there's not a whole lot of embracing going on. Would you try to convince people or would you just put it out there and hope that they come? Well, I think that if you really are serious about the business and you want to, uh, I call it, support your habit, (laughs) if you will, your genealogical habit, then you need to get out there. So I think I would give them a freebie service, tell them to go to my website and give examples to see so they can see how good it would be or what the options are or give them a taste. I wouldn't do the whole, you know, it would be just a taste, taste of podcasting. Wow, that's great advice. Give our audience one parting piece of advice and then tell us how we can get in contact with you. Parting advice, don't ever, ever take down any information without 
having the source citation. If you pick up a book, the very first thing you should do is write the source citation down, whether or not it's useful or not. Because if it's not useful, then you say negative so you don't ever look in that book again. Keep a research log. That's the best advice I can give you. And people can contact me a couple of different ways. I'm on Facebook. I also have a website. It's woodward-geiger.com. That's W-O-O-D-W-A-R-D-G-E-I-G-E-R.com. And I also have a couple of uh, blogs out there. But if you Google me, you could find me. I love that verb, Google. Linda, thank you so much for coming on the Genealogy Professional Podcast today. It has been my pleasure. It's been a great deal of fun. Thank you so much for inviting me. Well, I'm hoping after listening to Linda Woodward Geiger and I speak that you're saying, wow, there were a lot of really great nuggets in there. Some of the things that hopefully you took away were thoughts on the discussion about time management, how to manage your time when you're doing a project. Also, diversifying your services. Linda does a lot of non-traditional services for clients, such as the websites and the desktop publishing. You know, are there things that you can consider to do um, that might be a little bit different that draw on the skills that you already have? There was just so many nuggets in her um, discussion. And also the way she talked about how genealogy has changed from the 1990s to the present day. And that was very interesting as well. And that's something for us to consider, just how far we have come and how how many great educational opportunities we have now, especially on the internet with the way that we can access records on the internet and the way we can access education on the internet. The specific action item that I would like you to focus on for this week uh, is really to do with that last parting piece of guidance that Linda was talking about. And she said never to take information without a source citation. Last week, I was asking you to get out in public and and, uh, show your face and get to know people. Well, this is the complete opposite. This is a completely introspective action item that you can do by yourself, doesn't involve any other people. This is very safe, but it's difficult because you need to retrain yourself. So for the next week, anytime you do genealogical research, and I mean anytime, even online, when you go on to Ancestry.com or FamilySearch.org, do what Linda said. Write down the source citation first, okay? So say you're in Ancestry.com, you look up, you're looking for a piece of information. Perhaps you're looking for a person in the 1880 1880- federal census. Or if if you're not from the United States, maybe you're looking for a birth record uh, in your country or census records from your country. So pick a specific item. Okay, and this is specifically for online research. You fill in the the data fields and you see the search results. And you say, well, that looks like my person. Okay, so we're going to just presume here that's an ideal world and you can easily spot your target right there. And you're going to you're going to click into the record. Okay. before you click into the image and check out all the details that are on that image, stop and write down the citation or at least capture all of the information. Ancestry.com provides all the record source information on that record page. This is the page you click into before you go to the image. And FamilySearch.org does as well. So what I want you to do for the next week is to capture that information and put it into a Word document or some other kind of document and save that before you click into the image and check out all the detailed information that exists there. This is going to take discipline. It's going to take restraint because I know that you're going to want to click into the image and see everything that is listed about your ancestor or about your client's ancestor. Do this for an entire week. This is the tough part, one day at a time. So just try the first hour. Stop yourself before you write the information about the record. Write down the source information, okay? So let's all take Linda's words to heart. And again, to emphasize what Linda said, if it's a negative result and you don't find the information that you were looking for, you need to write that down too, okay? So that is your task. If you think about this, this is very much like dieting. When you are dieting, you need to stop and think about what you're eating before you put it in your mouth, okay? So I don't know anyone who hasn't attempted dieting at least once in their life. So do the same thing with this source citation. Before you check out a record, stop 
and write down that information and then go check out the record and then move on to your next step and do it again, but forcibly stop yourself to think about it. And if you could do that, wow, you are going to make great strides in becoming a better genealogist and maintaining better records. And you're going to save yourself so much time because you'll never doubt, did I go check out that record or not? So I have to really thank Linda Woodward Geiger for suggesting that because that's a really good action item for all of us, myself included. All right, that's it for this week. So long. So long.